Welcome all to my paranormal closet where the stories and magic take place. My guest today is a world-renowned exorcist and doctor of theology with over 30 years of experience casting out demons. He has appeared on The Dead Files and A Haunting in Saginaw, Michigan, with cases as seen on the television shows My Ghost Story and Paranormal Witness. Join me in welcoming G.P. Hacker to my show today. Welcome. It's a pleasure being here. Thank you so much for joining me today. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> I don't know if you know it, but I deal with the weird and unexplained on my show. And I reached out to you specifically because of your book on the Michigan Dogman. For the listeners tuning in today, the cryptozoological creature is described as a seven-foot-tall, blue-eyed or amber-eyed, bipedal canine-like animal with the torso of a man and a fearsome howl that sounds like a human scream. In your book, you detail 60 true stories from eyewitness accounts across the state of Michigan, along with a description of variance types and actual photos from eyewitnesses who have claimed to have seen this Michigan dogman. As I understand it, the first sighting of the dogman was in Wexford County in the year 1887. A couple of lumberjacks spotted him as they were working. Since then, there have been many reported sightings of this creature throughout Michigan, though most have been from the northern quadrant. What enticed you to write about the dogman subject? Well, uh, quite a few years ago, I was a vendor for Michigan Paracon in Sault Ste. Marie. And my wife and I, we set up our table and lo and behold, right next to us was uh, Linda Godfrey. And we became fast friends and uh, we started talking more about, well, at first it was funny because I didn't know who she was until I talked to my friend Todd Clements and he's also an author. He wrote Haunts of Mackinac and he's up there every year. And he's like, did you realize that you're right next to Linda Godfrey? And I'm like, mm, who's Linda no. Godfrey? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, I personally come from right from the church community and not really at the time was familiar with a lot of people in a paranormal or was mm -hmm. I interested in the paranormal? I mean, I was when I was a kid, I loved uh, the idea of Bigfoot, UFOs, that kind of thing. And I was, I liked to watch the uh, Scooby-Doo and all that. Um, so it intrigued me, but over time it just kind of went away. And so he was telling me about Linda and then he comes around and he says, yeah, I got to talk to her about my story. I'm like, what are you talking about? May I ask you who and Linda I, Godfrey is? Can you tell us? Oh, she is. Uh, she was the lady. Uh, she passed away. But she was the lady that everybody pretty much went to because she, um, when people had their dog man stories, they they wrote into her. They told her about them. I see. And she, she lived in Wisconsin. And she just, she... I don't believe that she ever saw one herself, but in Wisconsin, they have what's called the Beast of Bray Road. But as like I mentioned in my book, they're like, there's sightings of dogmen all over the world and, and different forms. And I remember the following year, I, I was talking to her and I gave her my theory at the time that I thought I was Di uh, Dinopithecus because I don't jump to the conclusions, especially when it comes to somebody coming to me and asking for deliverance. Um, we have, we're deliverance ministers, exorcists, we're trained to have an objective diagnosis. Um, we're not gonna believe it until the devil shows his face. And I myself have never seen a dog man. I've seen bear, black bear around here. In fact, last week I went out to get my mail and I live way out in the woods here in Michigan. And just down the road, I saw a huge black bear crossing from my neighbors or from across the road over to the other side. I have them in and, my yard too. <laughs> oh, do you? <laughs> yeah, that along with fox um, and deer and you mm -hmm. may have got it. <laughs> my wife, she works for a sport, sports store and I told her, I said, hey, you might want to get some bear spray just in case, because we have a have a boy and he likes to play out in the yard sometimes. And, and so I don't want to take the chance. But usually black bear are 
they're they're more scared of us than we sure. are them. They run away except that they got cubs, and that's when you have you're going to have a problem. Exactly. Um, but yeah, they. Um, Can you define Dinopithecus? It's a um, pretty much a, uh, a giant type of hyena, um, a little larger than a um, not a hyena, uh, hyena, but uh, a baboon. I'm sorry. Um, I was thinking of the hyena version of the dog man, <laughs> but uh, the they're just a large baboon. Uh, basically, they're a little bigger than than a person, and they usually, you know, they have have snouts. They um, have the kind of linky arms and the and the legs, that kind of thing, and they can walk upright. And so that's when I was talking to her. I said, "Well, have you ever thought of Diapithecus as you know one of the main theories?" And she's like, "You know, I've had people." come to me and tell me that uh, but i just don't know because there are so many accounts of this thing acting like wolves and so it just sparked my imagination uh, you know my, my curiosity more to look into it and i'm a person that um even though i'm a theologian and <laughs> you know i i am in the spiritual but I also am, am trained to, you know, uh, having to do deliverances, I have to know psychology and be familiar with it, be, be familiar with the human mind. And so, and as a doctor, you know, I'm trained to, you know, have a, uh, develop a hypothesis first and even test other hypothesis. And so I'm really into research. And so I have my own theories about it um you know it's a combination of the scientific and the spiritual um i do talk about it a little bit not relating to the dog man but it's at the conclusion of my new book serial killers and their demons you know i talk about it um we theologians have three theories basically on uh, the um the antediluvian age, the age before the flood, about how the giants came about. Um, one of those theories is that the uh, uh, the giants, the when the Bible was referring to the sons of God, that it is referring to the sons of uh, Shem, you know, like a holy type of race. They're set apart upon God, but a lot of us have just thrown that out doesn't make any sense but there are still a few pastors out there that do accept that because uh, there is a big problem in the church today that you know you go into a church today here in the united states and measure how it is in the other and other parts of the world but they don't want to talk about the devil they don't want to talk about demons they want to talk about exorcism uh, most occasionally my, my wife and i we visit churches and they tell me, you know, they ask me, so what do you do? Like, well, on the side, I have a ministry. I mean, you know, I do deliverance. And it's kind of, oh, okay. And it's kind of a taboo subject, which really irks me in a way because. So you're saying the, deliverance is uh, el eliminating demons, casting them out? Yeah, it's more of, I don't like to say that. I like to say that it's healing, healing the soul. It was it was uh, the number one miracle that was performed in the early church, and really what caused the early church to explode with, uh, uh, you know, its its numbers. And it, the Bible refers to it as signs and wonders. It doesn't talk, you know, like the word exorcism came later on in, in church history. Um, I lost my train of thought with where I was going to go with that, but. Um, but oh, oh, we have pretty much three theories of and the other one is, is that the the fallen angels, which the books of uh, Jubilees and the book of Enoch talk about, um, they're the watchers, the Gregori, sorry, the Gregori that had uh, come down, they were meant to watch over humanity 
and uh, they they lost their way and they Jude talks about how they shed their spiritual robes and uh, you know, the other theory is that because there's a lot that have branched off of that idea that they had actually physically mated with the children of 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 men you know the of daughters of men but and some of us are even starting to throw that out too that that has really no relevance because how can spirit mate with with flesh we don't see any possible way for that to happen the only way that spirit can really interacts with flesh is to enter it you know like and possession where evil either an evil spirit enters the person or the holy spirit enters a person and dwells in them which has led to this type of new theory called the demonic possession theory where it is believed because in, in my experience as an exorcist um I, I see it. I can see it happening. And there's a lot of studies out there in genetics that show that we really only know like maybe 10% of what genes can do. And demons and during interrogations haven't even admitted to me that, yeah, we have the capability of altering the genes, which really blew, blew me away. And that was under penalty of torment by the Holy Spirit. And that's why I know that they're telling the truth. And I've heard other exorcists explain the same thing that they've had them, they've heard them uh, admit that they're able to alter the genes, which has caused a lot of us to, to believe more in this type of theory where there were willing participants, humans, who allowed themselves to go through abuse and trauma that had, because I mean, we, go, we can go back to, like a good example is research that was done after World War II, where the Nazis at the time had, I talk about this in my book, the Nazis at the time had uh, the, well, the Dutch had rebelled against the Nazis, but what the Nazis had done is they had removed a lot of their their supplies and caused them to go through starvation. And the, the result of that was, of course, a famine there. And, but after World War II, scientists found out that there were, that this descendants of these people who went through starvation started to develop health problems and they found out that it was down at the genetic level so people that went through trauma and abuse were starting to their genes got altered and it affected their children and it was also the case with holocaust survivors people who have went through the the trauma and the abuse during the holocaust their children uh, resulted genetically to having diabetes and so my theory is that they because demons can't can't make you do something you don't want to do they have to break down your will and so what they do is they allow a person to go through abusive situations in their life which will alter the alter the genes of the person so that they can have a, a more susceptible host that they can influence to do things that they want them to do and later in life, which is the case of what happened with serial killers. They were abused and traumatic. If you compile a lot of their stories together, they they come about and are altered from adolescence. And they go through life experiencing that trauma that they have when they were young. They they experience dissociative identity disorder, and then later on in life, it affects them because all that emotion is buried down. So the these willing participants in the antediluvian age, 
were willing to go through situations that had altered them, allowing demons to come about them and to uh, alter their DNA, how they want them to be all, you know, how to change to suit more of their, their image. And because of those genes being passed on extensively onto their young, resulted in some possible mutations or what have you that had caused a giant race. That's just one theory. Because we have in, it, it, it's also proven, and you can go back and, and look that there is giganticism in our genes. We have people throughout history that have uh, experienced, you know, huge, um, Andre the Giant is one example. Um, several people throughout history, if you look back, have were very tall people. You know, it's so we're leaning more toward that aspect. Well, just for the listeners that don't know about your recent book, Serial Killers and Their Demons, GP um, reviews the lives of popular serial killers and makes determinations based on experience with casting out demons. And it explores the twisted minds of serial killers and the demons that drive them and influence their actions. And I read a lot of true crime stuff, so I'm fascinated that you believe demons enter these offenders. But what about the serial killers that have no history of abuse at all in their childhood? Well, at, at some level, there is something that causes the mind to fracture. And I get that question a lot is what causes dissociative identity disorder? And it's a subject that is, you know, divided the psychological and psychiatric communities. Um, I know a few counselors here in Claire that uh, debate about it and not very you know, when I bring up the subject, they're like, yeah, kind of like, oh, we got to talk about this again. Uh, myself, you know, I, as, as a counselor, you know, I'm not a licensed counselor, but, you know, as a pastor, minister, you know, I do counsel people and I have to for deliverance. They, there is some sort of trauma that does occur and trauma comes, trauma comes in all kinds of areas um a good example is john wayne gacy that guy experienced a lot of trauma um in different aspects he was verbally abused Did by he? his father okay. he was verbally verbally abused by his father he was beaten by his father he was uh molested by a 15 year old girl when he was i believe four and not only that but they're a uh, friend, their family friend, would take him out on joy, joy rides and sexually molest him. Um, so abuse comes in all different forms. There is, of course, sexual, which I see a lot in people, and which gives the demon Jezebel a right, and that's the number one right that she claims. And I encounter this demon a lot, and it's the most dangerous demon out there. And there is verbal abuse. And, and at this, at a very young age, this is why I'm, we have to protect our kids, folks. We have to, at, at this young age, even if it's not your kid and there's somebody that's a, a abusing them or in some way causing trauma to a young kid, it has to stop. Because I, these people that come to me for deliverance and their, their dissociatives come forward, it's all emotional pain. They're, it's, it's a painful experience in our healing and deliverances. And we treat demons as just a kind of an annoyance because the whole object of deliverance, of course, is to, to heal the soul of the person. And when demons pop up, and they do, well, you know, you just make them go down, hey, we're not done. And the whole objective is to weaken the demon before the exorcism. And exorcism is actually a very small part of deliverance. I know that's a lot of people want what they want to experience. I get that a lot. I get a lot of messages asking, hey, how can I join in on a deliverance? 
And it's funny because a lot of people, when they watch the deliverance and the other person is, the client is all right with it, they're, you know, the, the, the witnesses are watching. And I, I'll allow witnesses to come in because they want to boost their faith up. And they, they're kind of bored. And I, get, I, tell them, I tell them ahead of time, I'm like, well, just so you know that this is not what you think. This is more of a counseling session. And so we go through renouncing, we go through curse breaking and healing the soul, helping them to forgive their abusers their, and all the trauma that they went through. And they just, uh, and then when the exorcism ha happens by that time, the demons are very weak because they lost most of their rights. The strongholds are healed. They got nothing to hold on to. I've even had demons say, you know what, just, I want to go because <laughs> this person is too strong. So just so it sounds go. like demons are an everyday, <laughs> an everyday occurrence, actually, for a lot of people. It, I've one of one of my one of the frustrations that my team and I have is um, there's people in the paranormal community that say, "Well, demonic possessions rare, demonic activity is rare." No, it's not. No. <laughs> <laughs> we have rapes every day. We have murders every day throughout the world. We have wars. We have dictators. We have evil people in this world that want to harm others. It happens every day. And who's influencing them? Their own demons. I've even had people come to me and say, oh, I want to get tested to see if I have a demon. And they fill out our profile. And we go through some renouncing. And lo and behold, demon pops up. So how'd you get in there? And they usually tell me, and we go from there. And I interrogate them. But uh, yeah, getting back to that question that um, that you asked about uh, how you know the, those serial killers that have never faced abuse. Like one example is. Um, the uh, BTK killer, as my his name escapes me right now, um, but uh, yeah, he was he was one where I really had trouble trying to get right down to find anything in his youth, and a lot of them in their history uh, didn't really tell too much about their youth, which, but when I went back and saw what they did in the future all the killings that they did and I know which demon it is. I talk about that in the, in the book and revealing each serial killer. It just, it all adds up to one particular demon who brings in other demons. And I know this demon so well, cause I encounter it quite a bit. And I'm like, they have to, had to have had some sort of trauma in their youth somewhere back in there not just abuse, but some sort of trauma. Something that trauma. Have, but, mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Shipman, known as Dr. Death, it was another one where really there was no, nothing too much in his youth, but yet he had a domineering mother. Okay, well, in my experience, there is such a thing as generational curses. And they follow right down the line. The Bible talks about generational curses as pretty much flying around the generational line until somebody does something exactly the same as their ancestor. So let's say an ancestor has done a blood covenant, you know, maybe a human sacrifice way back there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of us, do you know your ancestry? Not, not. No. Back. A yeah, decent amount, of us, but not very far back, right? It takes about 45,000 people to 60,000 people, generations way back to make one person, to make you, to make me. And so we have a lot of ancestors. We have a lot of connections. So there's curses that are flying around out there, but they're not landing on anybody because a lot of us have not done what 
that particular person or ancestry has done. So let's say if somebody has done a human sacrifice, let's say like a, a German had done a human sacrifice to the, to the god Thor. Now Thor is another variation of the demon Lucifer. And Lucifer, a lot of the demons, they, they're the same type of demon. They're just in different variations and they're different personifications. Take for example with the, the, the main enemy of the church, the Jezebel spirit. Jezebel comes in many variations. Lilith, Kali, uh, Isis, Annette, and so forth. There's a lot of variations of the Jezebel spirit. I've had people, and to conf confirm this, I've had people, I had one, one lady who had Isis in the same room with another woman who had Lilith. And when they were both in the same room, they had that kind of connection, like they felt each other's spirit. They felt like when Lilith came forward and I was de dealing with her, the Isis spirit and the other lady would just started getting irritated and it usually manifests as anxiety. And people in the room that were witnessing this, they were like amazed. And I said, and one person spoke up and said, how is this? You know, what? And I said, well, it's, it's the same spirit. It's just a different personification. So even Lucifer takes on different personifications, Beelzebub, Baal, Belial, even himself, Lucifer. And personally, I like dealing with Lucifer because I, I honestly don't know why a lot of the other demons are afraid of him. Because the, the difficult demon that I, that I have to deal with is Jezebel. She manifests laughing. You know, she comes forward. She's like this. She's like, <laughs> <laughs> she thinks it's all funny. And so when she manifests, um, we deal with her and she lies quite a bit. We have to torment her. She only responds to authority and have to display that authority. And after much torment, she finally gives in to that authority. And I, it's, it's difficult to get information out of her. And so what is absolutely funny is Lucifer and Jezebel and whichever form, just they don't like each other, but yet they work together. Mm. Isn't that crazy? It really is. Yeah. And so How are you when they... And when this is all going on with the demons, yeah, uh, is it uh, talking through the person's body or is mm -hmm. it through? Oh, it is. Oh, it's so creepy. Yeah, yeah. They uh, the, they have each one of them has their own personality. They they each have their own. Uh, usually, however, the body language is, however, the tone of voice when they first come forward. You know, doing this for so long, I don't even have to ask what their name is. Yeah, like, oh, voices. This is, yeah. you know, Lucifer is usually angry, snarling. And he's just, mm, you know, he's angry. I don't know why he's angry. Um, Jezebel, of course, is laughing, giggling. She thinks everything's funny. She thinks God's funny, the whole topic of God. Um, Leviathan, he, him and murder are the only two demons that have ever tried to come at me, try to attack me. And uh, I have a video that's up on YouTube. Um, I'm not exactly sure where, but um, there was a guy, we had an open deliverance in Columbiaville, Michigan here. And this guy, um, he was a friend of mine and he actually, he wanted deliverance because he felt that he was being oppressed. And he, he started out from Chicago and he says, Hey, I just want to let you know, I threw up. And that told me right there from experience that, okay, whatever he has is it's judgment is, is coming. Mm -hmm. Usually if there's no reaction, when the person doesn't tell me that, when they're on their way or I'm on the, I'm on the way, I'll text them, say I'm on, on my way over to, to see mm -hmm. you. 
And if there's no reaction, I know that there's the deliverance is going to happen today. They're not going to be cast out. And they know when their judgment is near. And so he he started throwing up before he dro drove. And, and when he got there, and it was his time, his turn for his deliverance, all I had to do was like, well, let's see what you got. And they called whatever up. And they just came right forward and they confronted me. And this is these are all signs of, okay, yeah, I know that these guys are going to be cast out because they know it's their time. And that's just, that's very, I always thought that was very fascinating that they, they just, they know, they know when their time is. Yeah. And so they're, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. They, submit to you. they just submit to whatever it is. That, mm -hmm. Yeah. They'll, they'll fight more or they just give in or, you know, usually if they, they put up a fight, that's when I really dig into that person's psyche and okay, well, Let's find out what more that you have happening in your life. Because a lot of people think that demons live in the, in the now. They don't really live in the now. They live in your past. And so that's where we have to look at is a person's past to explore, the, explore where they are at that moment that they entered. And then we, then we explore that. We we renounce it, we cover it with the blood of Christ. So that sin does not exist anymore. And it can't be seen. It's called clean. And so now and demons are like, whoa, wait a minute. At this point in time where I entered is gone now. I got nothing to hold on to. Then I bring them back up. Do you have any more legal right? No. Okay, well then you gotta go. And then that's mm. what well, that's the point that where we start the exorcism is when they when they say, no, I don't have any more legal right. And we try to get them um, because there was in the past when I was starting deliverance, I was getting so frustrated after a deliverance that per, the people would, would get would get in their cars. They would drive down the road and all of a sudden they'd start manifesting. Mm. Like, OK, well, yeah, turn around, come back. Let's find out what you got, what's going on. I'm going to sit down and find Playing out games. from the yeah find out from the demons. Well, I didn't. That was just part of me that left. I I, I left a little bit of myself behind. Mm. And so now, when I do do exorcisms, I make them fully manifest. And what we do is um, get that because demons are emotional beings, and so I want to experience that person's emotion at the fullest you know like i tell them you know, tom you gotta you gotta bring up all that anger every bit of it i want to see all that anger and make sure that you know, like there's people that are able to hold them down if and you know make sure that it doesn't want to come at anybody and as the exorcist we try to make their entire focus on us away from everybody in the room and there's people that have tried in the past to try and to, you know can i say something to the demon they want to get right in and i want to you know can i experience can i experience this can i, can I ask a question absolutely not you know for one they're going to lie to you they're going to deceive you because now you're curious about them and you want something from something unholy rather than god and putting right. your focus on god so that's what exactly what they want is they want your attention to be drawn away from God upon them. And so I, I tell everybody that are that's involved in exorcism, look, don't talk to the demons. When they manifest, don't say anything. If you have a question, you can write it down, you know, toward me and slide it over to me i'll make the demons go down and we'll take a break and i'll answer your questions and so it's that's something that i am very livid about is don't don't interrupt don't talk to the demons don't try to you know just observe and you know witness and i've had sounds people like, that i'm sorry sounds like even something as um, simple to some people 
such as like unacceptance, let's say somebody who's in that place where they're being unaccepted, it could be so such a torment to their soul that that would be enough for them to do something horrible like be a serial killer. Let's say Jeffrey Dahmer, for example. I don't think there's anything in his history and his upbringing, upbringing that would lead you to believe there's a demon, but he did suffer from unacceptance for who he was and mm -hmm. felt like he was unloved, and maybe that was enough to make mm -hmm. him who there, he was at the end. And you can't abuse yourself. A lot of people don't realize that. People can't abuse themselves. It's sure. called self-hate. Even drinking and form of it. Mm -hmm. what we do, do to our bodies daily mm -hmm. is a form of that, I believe. Oh, yeah. Interesting. I've never heard of exorcism in this form before, but you've made it very clear mm -hmm. as to what it is. Mm -hmm. I see it, yeah, I see my, it differently now, let's just say. My my approach to, to exorcism is more, I want to get the person healed. I don't mm -hmm. want any form whatsoever for the demons to uh, sit down and you know have something attached to whatsoever. I want to heal the strongholds. I want to remove the legal rights. So I know that when that person leaves, they're they're healed. And you wonder for how long, though, because we could just keep on doing yep. this to ourselves over and over. Mm -hmm. Suffice it to say, you'll never be out of work <laughs> because it sounds yeah. as if we are all susceptible to a demon. Yeah, I, I sit down and I tell people when they're looking for deliverance, like, look, this is your deliverance. You're conducting the exorcism and deliverance. You decide if you want to break, break free or not. I'm just here as a guide. I'm here to help you. And they I mean it's we of course we are we are sinners. We're going to I, I there's been people actually there's like recently with that lady with the Lola spirit. Um and we, we do make mistakes. I admit I make mistakes. Um, and in her case, there were uh, three demons. There was, and demons will also go by the names to take on the personification of the person's abuser. A lot of people don't know that. And even an ancestral abuser. There was, in this lady's uh, case, she had a demon named Jacob. And she had a demon named Samuel. Well, I know that there is a demon named Samuel, a Luciferian spirit. And it's connecting Jezebel's spirit as Lilith. And that's what I believe that happened to um, the son of, in the Son of Sam killings. Okay. With David Berkowitz. Mm -hmm. is, you know, he, he had Jewish ancestry. And, and once you know, I saw the, the name Sam, I'm like, Samuel. And so she had Samuel, Jacob, and there was this uh, fem feminine entity. Um, I couldn't determine at the time if it was a soul tie or if it was a dissociative. And it was claiming to be a dissociative going by in the name Anne. That, um, and so we, we cast out Jacob we ca and we cast out Samuel. And she left and went back to her own state. Well, later on, you know, another event, she came up and she's like, I want you to check me again. I would, could hear the voice of God saying, you missed Anne. I'm like, okay. okay. So I want to explore this Anne again. Because then she actually had two sessions prior to the third. And the second one, uh, when we were casting out Samuel, I said, is there anybody else in there? And don't lie to me or I'll torment you. And I said, just that B, you know, I got to say the B word on your show. <laughs> and I'm like, 
Okay, so I started wondering about Anne because when I was talking to Anne, claiming to be a dissociative from her childhood, that it was we started the the fusion process, and a lot of exorcists don't do this if they're familiar with dissociative identity disorder, but I'm one of few that know how to fuse the dissociative back with the core personality. So we started the process of fuse, fusing back, and she didn't do that, which tipped me off. I'm like, I'm starting to wonder about Anne. And I started even wondering there if it was a Jezebel spirit, because Jezebels are very difficult to, to deal with. And so in the third session, when she said, well, I am going through all this and I, I, you know, I want you to check me out again. So we sat down and lo and behold, it was actually Lilith. Mm. And I know what Lilith, how she gets in. So I asked her some other questions. I'm like, okay, have you done this in your life? You know, something that you haven't told me. And it was a subject that a lot of women who have done it don't want to discuss it. And just when I erase it from their life, I said, okay, just remember that that's where they are. They're dwelling on that event that it was in your past. And so we had renounced it and uh, went back to, to Lilith because that's what she told me. That, that was her legal right. And I said, do you have any more legal right? It's like, no. It sounds and like so, you're, you're in, a, in, in a courtroom. <laughs> yeah, it is a courtroom <laughs> process. Negotiations. What is mm -hmm. what is meant by dissociative identity disorder exactly? Okay, dissociative identity disorder used to be called multiple personality disorder. Uh, okay. Mm -hmm. And personalities, personalities do exist in the mind. And what happens is, the best way I explain it to people when they ask is, you take an egg. Egg is whole. And that's a young egg. And so think of that as a child. It's okay, well, uh, I want to take and make other personalities. So you drop it. What does it do? It cracks. So all those cracks, all those different pieces that are being made are different personalities. So those, those shells are their own pieces of shell. That's essentially what happens to the mind. If you take abuse, trauma, and have it go through that, have that uh, child go through that experience, the mind fractures. So if, uh, like, if your neighbor is a pedophile and starts abusing the child early in life, then what, what happens is, see, children, of course, we have this mindset similar to the image and likeness of God. We're innocent. And that's all we know is we want to experience the fruits of the spirit. We want to experience love. The child wants to experience love, patience, kindness. Not all, not all the time patience, but um, the good things in life. And we trust uh, people that are close to us, our friends, our family. And when somebody like that, even a family friend, in the case of John Wayne Gacy, uh, turns on us and starts performing evil acts on us, then the mind cannot comprehend what's going on and it dissociates, it leaves. Well, somebody has to come forward. I, Mark, let me get back to what I'm saying. The personality, the core personality leaves. And so the mind fractures. It breaks off a piece of it itself and brings that forward. Now, a great example of this is in the demonic of Gadara, where the scripture talks about when the gentleman came out of the tombs, he was yelling and screaming, gnashing of teeth, and cutting with, with sharp stones. I experience that a lot with people that come with me, especially that mm -hmm. have Jezebel, is... When I, I see marks on them or they have some sort of fantastic addiction, the dissociative is constantly experiencing that pain that it went through in childhood. It's always there. It's always holding on to it. And so it's a way 
that God has, has allowed our minds to go through to actually have us survive. And I tell these dissociatives and they come forward and like, thank you. Thank you so much for your presence. You have allowed this person to survive. And because they're a child living in a grown up body, they're a little angry over this situation. Well, I got to hold on, hold on to this pain. You know, I'm making this person live so much. And so I have to talk to them and ease them in to let them know, like, well, look, you know, Ted is 45 now. He's an adult. He can experience this trauma that you're going through and sort through it. And he can actually protect you. Mm. And then they, we want to get at least like, 51% of the soul to agree to accept Christ. And this ticks off demons. And so I'll lead the dissociative because it is part of that person that is without Christ to Christ. They accept Christ and they begin to start to begin that fusion process will fuse them. And usually the one demon who, who claims the legal right is, is, over abuse is Jezebel. A Jezebel spirit. And then when that happens, the fusion happens, Jezebel has nothing to hold on to, but she'll still claim a legal right. And Jezebel has, in any form, has this unique motherly characteristic about it. And she will try to bring up that dissociative that's a child as its own and deceive it, morph it into the person it wants to be because demons can't make you do something, but they can make your dissociatives do something hmm. or even use soul ties in the person to manipulate your mind to do something. And that's where the, the change comes in by people. And you really allow these serial killer accounts. So like, I don't remember doing it. Mm. Or I have no recollection of going that far. It's the dissociative that is in pain, trying its best to relieve the pain. That's why, like in the Bible, the demoniac had was cutting because it was in, inwardly that emotional pain. It, it was doing its best to relieve the pain, trying to, you know, it's a buildup. And the same thing with a lot of these serial killers is. They say, well, it became an addiction. When after I did it, it was a, it felt like a big release. And that's why they do it again. Because over time, the dissociative builds up the pain again until they can't tolerate it anymore. It's got to release it. And so that's why it's so important to get to these dissociatives as quickly as possible and, and heal them. Mm. Wow, so interesting. Well, why don't you go ahead and tell the listeners how they can find your books, especially this new Serial Killers and Their Demons book that you came out with. Uh, they can find them on Amazon. Uh, the Kindle uh, version of it will be coming out on the 21st, uh, this fr Friday. I um, uh, have other books as well. I talk about my story. It's called The Equalist. And that can be found. It's a red cover. And... Uh, a lot of people go to Amazon to, to find my books, but they're uh, once once published, they start trickling out into other other bookstores as well online. Do you have a personal website of your own? Uh, not yet. Uh, I believe that I do own the domain name gphaggart.com. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if you try it, it should take you to my webpage. I've uh, been so busy with a lot of multiple things uh, that I just haven't really got around to to doing it. Um, it's hard to I'm fit really it trying to, yeah, <laughs> I'm tra training people, been writing. Uh, you know, I also do have a full-time job, so I'm working there. I'm transitioning, uh, hopefully, into uh, starting my own type of business. Um, I do, uh, I do, um, I, I have helped uh, people uh, build churches and ministries in the past. Uh, I have a lot of business knowledge, so um, that's that's full time work. It's, so this is uh, 
deliverance ministry is something I do on the side, hopefully mm -hmm. being able to do it full time. I'd like to do it full time, travel around to other states, even other countries and helping to deliver people. So that's my goal. I do hope that this show brings in people who need your help be able to find you. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate this. I know we started off with Dogman and that was my original intention, but I really did mm -hmm. find the subject of exorcism and the whole serial killer thing very interesting and informative. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you for having me. And to the listeners, if you liked listening to this week's episode and you're into all things paranormal, check out my other show, Eleanor Wagner's Creepin' It Real podcast out of the Coast to Coast Entertainment Network, which is available wherever you get your podcasts. And if any of you are interested in reading any of my books, you can find the link to them on my website, authoreleanorwagner.com. I write about the history of the town and location, add the paranormal story to the mix, and finish it all off with photos and evidence. Everybody loves a good ghost story, but there's nothing better than a true ghost story. So check it out at authoreleanorwagner.com. Thank you again. Thank you.